Welcome to episode four of the Dateline Downtown podcast. This is your host, Juan Hernandez, here with a very special guest for the first time, Christopher Sharp. Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Juan. I'm so excited to be here. and so happy you all are doing these podcasts. I think they're really great. Thank you. Thank you. Ted has been doing a really good job interviewing other people. So Ted's it's my awesome. first time first time interviewing, so it, it'll, it'll go well. <laughs> It'll do fine. So we're not going to really get into a lot about you specifically since we already did that with Ted for our upcoming issue. Yeah. We're mainly going to talk about the topic is the topic on homelessness. Mm-hmm. And for those who may not know, homelessness was part of your upbringing. Mm-hmm. Can you briefly describe what that was like? Because many college students like myself do not have a clue as to what an experience like that can be for for a young child yeah you know um homelessness is difficult you know for anyone but particularly for young people um i um had just turned 18 when i was homeless um and um i come from a background where i don't have a lot of support systems i grew up in foster care so it was particularly challenging and i think a lot of young homeless people find themselves in um those circumstances and so when we talk about homeless, we have to homelessness. We got to think about a couple of things. Um, the narrative around homelessness has typically been um, uh, one that we should try to change. And so we talk about homelessness like we talk about diabetes or bipolar, right? No one is born homeless. People are without homes, and so that's how I like to think about it, um, because people become homeless due to a set of circumstances that have happened to them. No one is just automatically homeless, and so. I think that most young people who are homeless have, you know, similar circumstances that, that lead them to be homeless, and so it's it's challenging because you don't really have anyone to back, um, to fall back on, um, and you feel like you're alone a lot. And um, you know, being homeless in a big city like Houston is, you know, somewhat of a blessing and a curse because Houston is, you know, the hub for human trafficking. Um, when you're homeless, you are struggling to survive and meet basic needs, and so there's really three things that young um, homeless people engage in, and that is, um, one, they either become violent criminals where they rob people um, or, you know, they break into houses to meet their needs. Um, and two, they um, a lot of times get engaged in the street economy um, through dealing drugs. Or, or three, they end up in sex work. And a lot of times when you're doing survival sex, that can lead to, to trafficking. Um, so it is certainly something that um, is um, difficult for anyone, but particularly for young people who feel like they don't have support systems. So generally what you're saying is it's uh, labels being placed on on homeless people. Yeah, um, you know, uh, and, and, and really it's about, it's about support systems. Mm-hmm. It's about young people having connections um, because people end up homeless because they don't have the connections they need mm-hmm. to not be homeless. Do you believe that this way of thinking, the way that people think about when it comes to homeless people can be changed instead of, you know, like, instead of judging somebody for how they look or how they act? Yeah. You know, um, there's a really um, a good experiment that happened in Los Angeles a couple years ago. Um, and uh, we what they did is they put... Um, they had regular streets and sidewalks and they put big signs on them and um, pasted them to the ground and they said um, you'd stop to take a look at this sign but you would just pass up a homeless person and it was it was shocking they you know they had video watching it and so people would would stop and stare at these signs um, but they would pass up people and we do that all the time right we're at University of Houston downtown. There are a lot of homeless people here, and a lot of times we just pass them and ignore them, um, and and we automatically make judgments about them. And so I think that a big part of that is we blame homeless people for being homeless, Mm -hmm. and um, it's their fault. You know, they're not working hard enough. They're not uh, doing the things they need to do in order to not be homeless. And and I think that a big part of changing the way we think about homelessness again thinking about people as being without homes rather than them being homeless is very important. Um, no one chooses to be homeless. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are very few people who will actually say, I am choosing to be homeless. Mm-hmm. But even, you know, those folks probably would rather be housed somewhere. And so um, we need to really begin to think about homeless people as people and, and understand them in their environment. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is understanding the things that have led them to be homeless. You know, I was homeless because I grew up in the foster care system and I didn't have connections and you know when I turned 18 I had to um, um, 
leave the home that I was in, and that made me homeless. Um, you know, a lot of LGBT people, particularly LGBT youth, um, who are homeless because, you know, they come out to their families and they get kicked out. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, 40% of the homeless population, um, homeless youth population, identifies LGBT. And so we really have to look at what are those circumstances? You know, why is this family not accepting? What can we do to help them? Um, this young person who aged out of the system, why don't they have resources to become uh, um, self-sufficient? And when we do that, I think we can begin to change the way we think about homeless people and homelessness. Mm -hmm. That actually answers some of the questions that I had on here. I mean, personally, Growing up, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, but I, I whenever I saw a homeless person, I, I would make that judgment right away. But in coming across people like yourself, and like you said, you know, you gotta look at them as human beings, not as just some like I guess trash or yeah, yeah, and whatever and, you may call it. Yeah, and and you're right. I think a lot of people do see homeless people as trash. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, we certainly discard them in our minds the same way we would discard trash and uh, I think it's um, uh, really important to to again understand the circumstances that led to people uh, being homeless um, I experienced the same things when I was homeless I wasn't the type of person where I wanted to to beg people for money I, I did um, a lot and I got passed up a lot you know um, in fact most of the time I did it was a struggle just to meet my basic needs and you know, it was one of the reasons why, you know, I um, had to turn to sex work in order to, to, you know, survive. And I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of people turn to, you know, engaging in other illicit behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and the resources are, you know, um, stigmatized for homeless people as well. There are a lot of resources that um, are out there for folks, um, but a lot of times there are barriers to accessing them. Um, a lot of times for LGBT people, you know, there are many organizations such as Star of Hope where their faith-based mission excludes LGBT people. And so it's difficult for you to feel comfortable even being in that environment. So um, it's, it's, it's really important for us to look at the ways that we are, you know, um, navigating, dealing with homelessness and think about the ways that we think about these people. So would you say it's a combination of being misinformed or a fear and a fear of reaching out for help I think it's it's both yeah um, for um, for homeless youth particularly whenever you become homeless the first thing that pops into your mind you don't think about well what is what are the shelters or services available to me right you have no um, ideas about systems or, or bureaucracies or the things that go behind these things and so there's it's not what happens and so I think one, yes, young people and people in general are um, misinformed about the services that are available to them. And then two, I think that there is um, some difficulty in even obtaining those services because a lot of these places place restrictions on people. For instance, most of the shelters in Houston, they make you leave during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can come at night and sleep, but um, a lot of them won't allow you to bring weapons into the facilities, for instance. And so, uh, yes, we can justify that, right? Mm -hmm. We think about that. We want people to be safe in here. Yeah. Um, we want the volunteers to be safe, the other clients who are here to be safe as well. But think about when you put those people back on the street the next day. How are they going to protect themselves? Being homeless is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And the things that they're engaged in probably to, you know, um, meet their basic needs are dangerous as well. And so a lot of places won't even let you bring bags or stuff in. So that's a barrier. And so you have to really begin to look at those things in order to look at how we can alleviate homelessness. And so both are really issues. Uh, misinformation and fear of reaching out. When the latest numbers, latest numbers for homeless students in America were released by the Department of Education, what was your initial reaction? Were you were you surprised, or were you already aware of of this? I don't want to call it epidemic, but this ongoing problem. Yeah, well, well, it is an epidemic. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's you know um, the the numbers are shocking, and I was surprised, but not surprised. Um, our um, the way that we are looking at things um, is, is, is different, and I think worldviews need to change. And so one of the big things is that our legislators 
all around the country. Uh, the federal legislators and state legislators are not investing money into resources that they used to. Um, and and what you've seen is a lot of cut in services to um, people who are homeless. Now, when you talk about students who are homeless, mm-hmm. um, a lot of young people now feel the pressures to go to college. You have to go to college in order mm-hmm. to meet your basic needs. Um, in Texas, and particularly at UHD, we have a, um, a high number of um, out-of-state uh, students, students or who are categorized as out-of-state where they pay double the tuition. Mm-hmm. And so with limited financial aid, with um, you know limited access to resources from families, if they have families, uh, you can see how challenging it would be for a young person to pay for tuition and be able to meet their basic needs. But if you think about the pressures they face, you think about the fact that we have to go to college now to do anything, and that's in young people's heads. I mean, it's ingrained early on, particularly all throughout high school. Um, so to be able to to meet those needs is, is, is challenging for young people. And so we've seen a rise in tuition. Um, we've seen a decrease in um, uh, public assistance um, with uh, financial aid, but also with other resources as well. I mean, dormitories are just, you know, mind-blowing how much it costs you to stay on campus and they require you to buy a meal plan and all these other things. It's just ridiculous. So it's no wonder students are finding themselves in situations where they do not have adequate housing. It's a... Uh it's amazing. I wasn't, I wasn't aware myself of this epidemic that was going on until I saw your story on Fox Twenty Six News, and where they also where you, they also mentioned the homelessness in the within the LGBT community, mm-hmm. which you already elaborated on, mm-hmm. and you know it's it's very. I find it personally. I find it very very uh, satisfying to see a success story like yourself you know fighting fighting the what am i trying to say here fighting the good fight fighting the good fight <laughs> you know helping the initiative what, what are some of the things that you have done to help the initiative or campaign to to fight this epidemic yeah well you know um LGBT homelessness is a huge issue all across our country. Um, when you think of 40% of the homeless youth population being LGBT, that's almost one in every two. Mm-hmm. Um, that is staggering. And so, um, you know, one of the big things that we're doing right now, um, Houston is one of two priority cities that were chosen to um, create a blueprint to address LGBTQ homelessness throughout our nation, Houston and Cincinnati. Um, And we were chosen because one, we have a a very good infrastructure um, already, um, uh, but two, because we have a lot of work to do. Um, And so, you know, working with various agencies, I'm a social worker as well, so I I can see it from both perspectives, from the perspective of an individual, a client who was homeless um, uh, before trying to access services, and from the perspective of a worker who is there to provide services. And so I I can see a lot of the barriers that we face. I've talked about Star of Hope. Covenant House was one a couple of years ago. They um, used to restrict LGBT people from coming to um, their facilities. And a lot of times they would disenfranchise them, put them in corners, um, um, segregate them from the rest of the population, further disenfranchising them. Um, Transgender people have um, difficulty accessing Uh, homeless shelters as well and it's because of the policies um, that are in place at a lot of these places so one of the big things that we're doing now is looking at how can we make these policies more LGBT friendly we don't need to segregate LGBT people we we certainly don't need to deny trans people from having access to these shelters and we don't need to allow those people to be harassed in there Mm -hmm. Um, I read a study recently that indicated that almost 60 percent of trans people reported being um, harassed uh, in a uh, homeless shelter and that's ridiculous Um, and trans people shouldn't have to deal with that type of harassment no one should particularly people who are trying to get on their feet who are trying to be homeless so looking at those policies at our existing infrastructure seeing where we can make things more friendly but also looking at what we can do to help provide resources to these people the young people who are being kicked out of their homes because their families don't support them how can we educate those families how can we talk to those families about you know the the challenges that they're these young people are facing how can we get them to be more accepting? Um, where can we find support systems for these people? Um, looking at all of those things are, are really important. And so it's, it's something that's going to take a long time. It's something that's going to take uh, a lot of effort. But we are working towards um, uh, trying to make a dent in the issue. Christopher, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, do, you have a, 
do you have a website where people can reach you? Uh, Twitter, maybe? Of course. People can Facebook. Twitter me and Facebook me. I'm on Twitter at Sharp Christopher. That's S-H-A-R-P-K-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R. And I think Facebook is the same, too. But if you follow me on Twitter, I, I think I have links there. So, yeah. Um, really important stuff. Uh, I think that it's great that you all are taking a look at this, and I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you very much. And for all the listeners out there, you can always visit us at Dateline Downtown on Facebook. Follow us at the Dateline and visit the website, datelinedowntown.com slash podcast for all podcasts, including Christopher Sharp. Christopher, thank you. Thank you, Juan.